This is Lisa Elwine, and I welcome you back to 50,000 Degrees and Cloudy, A Better Resurrection. So thank you, uh, brave student, for returning back to the, the second uh, segment of our resurrection study. And in the, the last program, we looked at different hermeneutical tools, Bible research tools, because if we use the proper tools, the likelihood that we'll go off on some strange direction, it cuts down on that. Now, people can still twist the tools and they can twist the rules, but we're going to try not to do that. We're going to try to use context. And again, going back to the beginning. If we keep going back to the beginning, then we'll have the most solid foundation for what we build on top of it. So, uh, one of the, the methods, again, is looking at patterns. Say so there's words in the hood, there's all sorts of things, first mention, complete mention, progressive mention. But sometimes in that prime acreage, that real estate of a Torah scroll, you find that themes are layered. And if you see that similarity or that joining of themes early, in their earliest mentions, then you'll pick up on it maybe when you see it over in the prophets. And then because you already have the code, you can decode what you're reading in the prophets or maybe even the gospels or the epistles. One example is the layering of themes. Like we said, if you see these two things working together in a specific way, over here, you might notice them doing the exact same thing over here. For instance, going back to the creation, the number three remains since then a symbol of resurrection. Yeshua I said three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Uh, that's a sign of resurrection. Uh, and by the way, um, when we look at the, the sign of Jonah, it's interesting because he's pairing the idea, not just with the number three, which we know is a number of resurrection. He's also giving you a hidden number. It's a mystery, but it's not that mysterious if you have studied the resurrection from the beginning because there were two types of resurrection days. One is going to be a resurrection of the trees and the plants on the third day of creation. And the other is going to be a giving of life to the birds and to the fish on the fifth day of the creation. So when Yeshua says the sign of Jonah, three days and three nights, there's the number three. But the sign of Jonah, Jonah, went into the belly of a fish, and Jonah's name, Yonah, means dove, which is a bird. So he's given you two secret signs, basically. Fifth day signs, because the birds and the fish were created on the fifth day. There is a relationship to draw between the third day and the fifth day when it comes to the resurrection. Aside from the Jewish tradition, that says Jonah was actually uh, the son of the Shunammite woman who was resurrected. And so if he says the sign of Jonah to a Jewish person, they believe that that was Jonah. So you've got an even deeper allusion to the resurrection. This is somebody who actually was resurrected from the dead. It's associated with birds and fish. And it goes back again to the resurrection of the third day because of the number of the days. He was in the belly of the fish. So you see how that layering, Yeshua is using that in the first century. And now it's easier to understand, like when he explained himself, his resurrection, starting with Moses and the prophets, why it was so easy for him to do so. So we're using his same rules here, his same methods of going back to the beginning. And that's the way Yeshua taught. He would say, no, you got it wrong. In the beginning, it wasn't like that. And that's what we need to be able to do. Say, okay, we know how it is now, 
but how was it in the beginning? Because that gives us a solid framework. So, on the third day of creation, and we can use a menorah to count these things and see how they're connected. The third day of creation, we know that the trees and seed-bearing plants were brought forth from the earth. Right? There was a gathering of the waters into one place, which caused the dry land to appear. And then count how many times on day seed. Day seed. That's a good way to do it, too. On day three, it says seed. Fruit with seed in them. Why? Because the hope is in the seed. The hope of resurrection is in the seed. The plant, the fruit may appear to die, but because of the seed, there is hope of resurrection, and that fruit in that way will live again through the seed. So that's on the third day. And that's where we get this idea of the resurrection. We also know that scripture uses the trees as metaphors of human beings. So metaphorically, prophetically, there was a resurrection on the third day of creation where the trees of the field were brought forth out of the ground. Great prophecy right there. Who needs to go past Genesis 1 for great prophecy? So again, using that, we know that it corresponds to the third feast of the, the Hebrew year, which is the first fruits of the barley. Because on the third day, we got the first fruits from the earth. Now we've got another prophecy of Yeshua. He was the first fruit from the dead. So we've got an overlapping theme of a biblical feast, the first fruits. We've got the creation day with first fruits. And there we have this idea of resurrection from the dead. Now, the third spirit of Adonai that's listed in, in Isaiah is etza, etza. That root word there is etz, which means tree. So, translating it into English, the spirit of etza is the spirit of counsel. So, it's like the spirit of the tree. And that doesn't mean that trees have spirits, but again, it's prophecy. It's giving you a symbol to help you understand. And so the spirit of counsel gives you what? Resurrection hope. That's what counsel does. Um, if it's nothing more than judgment, there's not much hope. Because it's just like, you're getting judged, that's the end. But if there is counsel, there might be a constriction like on the third day of creation, the waters had to be gathered, they had to be constricted so that the dry land could appear. You have to restrain one thing in order to release something else. And so that's what good counsel does. It might give you a reproof or a rebu rebuke or an encouragement, but they're really all the same thing because it's a view toward life, not simply punishing you. So even though you might have been corrected, or disciplined, it's giving you more hope for the future. It's a resurrection spirit. So you can see how many times these layers of threes are being repeated throughout the scripture. Um, again, if we look over here at the fifth day, right? And ironically, if we look at this again, as continuous circles. And I'm going to show you how that works here in just a second. But let's say you're counting one, two, three, third day. But what if you count from this side? One, two, three. Okay, that would be the fifth. Or you could flip it around. One's the third and one's the fifth. On the menorah, the way that this was constructed in the tabernacle, the third and the fifth would have come from the same place on the main branch. Their origin would have been the same. So whether you're talking about a resurrection of the third day or a resurrection of the fifth day, you're still on topic because one is a little bit different manifestation 
of the other. Remember on the fifth day, and let me turn it here. Maybe it'll be easier to see it visually. What if I turn it like that? I don't know if you can see how I turn the third and the fifth days or the third and the fifth feasts. When you see that, maybe the visual is easier. But with the fifth day, there was a new life. Just like there were new plant lives created on the third day, there was new living beings created on the fifth day. Because this is the first day that you have living creatures. On this fifth day, symbolizing resurrection, he makes birds and fish. And they basically do the same thing. They both work with the seasons. They um, work on currents. In other words, the way that they travel, you have air currents for birds, you have ocean currents for the, the sea fish. So basically what the birds reveal to us above is what's going on beneath the water. The fish are doing the same thing below the water in a concealed way. And that's one of those nicknames um, of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the fifth feast. It's the hidden day, the day and the hour that no man knows. So the fish are telling you this hidden aspect of the resurrection of the fifth day, whereas the birds are giving you that flight uh, message of the fifth day resurrection. Now, it's not random that Yeshua goes first and he calls fishermen. He says, come on, I'll, I'll make you fishers of men. So if we know our first mention of fish on the fifth day of creation, we get the depth of what he's saying when he calls these fishermen disciples and saying, hey, come on, let's go fish some people. The, the fifth day of creation, this resurrection day of, of new life, was actually symbolic of the resurrection of the dead. So there was a third day resurrection that involved Yeshua and the saints of old, but there's also going to be a fifth day resurrection of the greater body of Messiah, which is why Yeshua came saying, come on, let's go fish some people. Uh, I'd like to uh, read from uh, a certain passage here, and this is going to be from Ezekiel 17, 23 through 24. And I want you to see how once you learn that pattern, you can start recognizing it in other places. Because now you have a pattern, if I see the third and the fifth, in other words, the trees and the birds and the fish in the same context, it's likely talking to me about resurrection. Because that's the theme of both days. One of living plants, one of living creatures. So it says here in Ezekiel, it says, On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it. So you could see the pairing there, right? Some things go with other things. Like when, when people eat steak, a lot of times they want potatoes, whether it's baked potatoes or French fries or sweet potato fries. Steak and potatoes go together. In scripture, trees and birds, or trees and fish, are paired. They go together because they're resurrection symbols. So he's talking about producing fruit, all right? And that was the characteristic of the trees on the third day. They didn't just bear fruit. It says they bore fruit with seed in them. They had the ability to reproduce. And he says it's going to be a noble cedar. Remember, trees represent people. They're metaphors of people. So he's saying, you know what? When I plant human beings, I'm going to make them noble in this prophecy. And in the trees, it says, will be every kind of bird. 
and birds of every sort. Now this should make us think about Zechariah's prophecy about um, the nations coming up to Jerusalem at Sukkot. It should make us think of John's revelation where he says from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Because if the birds and the fish are the symbols on the same day, the fifth day, then when Yeshua says, hey, we're going to go fish people, he's also talking about birds. And he says, birds of every sort will nest in its branches. So what is he doing? He's pairing third and fifth day resurrections. And he says, all the trees of the field. Again, that's human beings. And then he's talking about how he's going to put everything right. If it's a self-exalted high tree, he's going to pull it down. But if it's a green tree, if it's a, a tree that has been caused to uh, be made low, that has dried up, he says, you know what, I can put the green back in it and lift it back up. And so he says, I have spoken, right, and I will do it. The resurrection is going to occur with sound. There's going to be a shout at the resurrection. He says, I have spoken and I will do it. In other words, I want you to look at these symbols and understand that he causes death and he also restores life. He tells us that repeatedly. And so if there is death, he's saying, I am perfectly capable of sorting through in the judgment, the trees and the birds and I can raise up and make to flourish, not just the tree, but also the birds who depend upon the tree. And if you'll notice in the order of creation, he makes the trees before he makes the birds, because the birds depend on the trees for their food. So they're, they're codependent in a good way. He lays a foundation and then he builds on it. You can see also in uh, John's revelation, he talks about how the sea will give up its dead, right? And remember our first symbol of life um, of a living creature was the fish. So there's another pairing that we can pick up on. The sea will give, it'll give up its fish. It'll, it'll give up the dead people and the earth will give up its dead. All right, the trees or the seeds that have fallen into the ground and died, they're going to give up their dead for resurrection and judgment. And so there again, we get our pairing, the third day and the fifth day. Um, and that feels good when you start to see those patterns and you see how the scripture connects um, with it, then it, it makes you feel a little bit better that you can finally get a handle on maybe some of the obscure language um, or that you appreciated the words before, but now you appreciate them at a greater depth because he sticks with patterns to help us understand better. And that's you know what it says in Revelation, the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. So we've got a neighborhood. That's why we call it words in the hood. Now we've got a neighborhood. We've got a pairing of birds and fish on the fifth day with a pairing of trees, plants, seeds on the third day. And when we start seeing these things in the same neighborhood, just like we read, then we can read into it. Oh, this is a resurrection passage. I mean, ultimately, I think it's all resurrection. It's all life. But in terms of helping us decode exactly what the resurrection is and how is it prophesied, so therefore how should we see it today, I think it's important that we learn to find these words in the hood. Another technique, another method is looking for chiasms, and they're all through scripture, by the way. You cannot read scripture without running across something called a chiasm. And you can tell right off the bat that's not a Hebrew word. It's uh, actually borrowed from the Greek, uh, chi. A chiasm gives you a mirror-like structure. Like the Greek letter chi, it looks like an X. So in your mind's eye, if you will fold the X on itself, 
you can see that the X really is just a mirror image when you open it back up. And that's what a chiasm does. It creates a mirror image because it's a balanced uh, presentation of ideas. For instance, let's say you just took this menorah and if it were possible, if this were hinged right here in the middle and it could actually be um, folded on itself, if you can see that in your mind's eye, you can see that once I folded this menorah in the middle, then this branch and this branch would be touching. They would be like one branch. This branch and this branch would be touching like one branch. This branch and this branch would be touching like one branch. And then this would stand alone. It's going to fold over on itself in the chiasm. Why? Because it's the center point or the axis of the chiasm. So amazingly, scripture is written with multiple chiasms. And what that does, remember when you see things in the neighborhood, you realize they have a relationship to one another. And with a chiasm, it makes it really easy for you to find the main idea because of the, the actual structure of the passage. And which that example was with an object, showing you the chiasm, how you could fold a menorah. That's a chiasm of an object. But you can learn chiasms of words and scripture so that it will help you find the midpoint, the axis, the central idea. Uh, for instance, just use this in your mind's eye as representing, representing the seven feasts of Israel, like Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits of the barley, first fruits of the wheat, uh, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Right? So if I were to fold it on its axis, then it makes sense now because we know that we celebrate Sukkot in remembrance of Passover, right? They're joined at the same place right there. So it's basically one thing. We just looked at the third and the fifth days, how they're joined in the same place. So they are both resurrection days. Uh, if we look at these middle ones here, right? You've got unleavened bread. You've got Yom Kippur. They're both a type of fast, all right? A type of separating from sin in some way. So what does that say to us? These things mirror one another, but their axis is Shavuot or Pentecost. It celebrates the giving of the Torah. If you want to find out about all these things on either side, the matched pairs, where do you go? You go to the Torah itself. They're all contained in the Torah. So that's your axis. And so it branches out on either side. So you can also do that, like I said, with words. You can make a chiasm with words. So if, if you've got a Bible handy or if you don't, uh, you can look it up later. But the book of Daniel is written in a chiasm. The entire book is a chiasm. In fact, the book of Revelation is a chiasm. Um, but in fact, if you want to see what that chiasm is in Revelation, get you a copy of 50,000 Degrees and Cloudy. Uh, one of my great students, Mariella, found that chiasm as we work through our Torah classes. And it was just spectacular the way that it's set up. But it's similar to the book of Daniel. Because if, you, if you're looking at the book of Daniel right now in your Bible, uh, you can see that Daniel 2 is discussing four Gentile world empires. If you flip back to Daniel 7, you can see that in that section, in that passage, it also refers to four Gentile world empires. If you go from chapter 2 to chapter 3, you're going to read about the Gentile persecution of Israel. If you flip over to Daniel 6, then you'll see that is also about 
Gentile persecution of Israel. So what is the axis? The axis is actually found in Daniel 4 and 5, in those two chapters. And the axis of the Gentile world empires, the axis of Gentile persecution of Israel, the very heart and center of it is that there is divine providence over the Gentiles. In other words, Israel will prevail over the nations. And so these things are simply illustrating what is at its center. You know, if we set up the, the chapters like this, you know, you might have Daniel 2, Daniel 7, uh, Daniel 3, Daniel 6. And what would the axis be? It would be Daniel 4 and 5. Those would be the center. So sometimes it might be like this. You have an odd number. When you have seven, obviously you're going to have an exact center, but the exact center can also be two verses or two passages or two chapters, right? The axis itself may be a mirror of itself. And so it's really fun to look for those. Um, when, you, when you're studying, when you have time, they'll show up in some strange places, even in these long passages with uh, ordinances and, and so forth. But again, it's, it's based on the letter X. It's forming a mirror. And so that helps us also if we look at the menorah itself as a mirror. That helps us understand how it's not just, yes, this one and this one are related because they come from the same spot. But when you're looking at a menorah, you're looking at a world, earth view. When you look at a menorah from the heavens, it doesn't look like this because we're talking about a rainbow now. The menorah actually represents the full rainbow. What if you do this? Right? Now you see the rainbow. That would be the heavenly view, the spiritual view. But if you do this, you get the earthly view. So when you have the earthly view, you're supposed to be able with your spiritual eyes to see the rainbow sitting on top of it. So that now you see the full menorah. Instead of just half of you, the physical view, you now have both the physical and the spiritual view. And now you see the circle of the rainbow. Now we know that this menorah that says in Revelation represents the seven spirits of God. And what does that do? Well, a rainbow basically takes white light that you can't see. It refracts it through droplets of light or of water, of rainwater or moisture in the atmosphere. And once it bends it, it bends it into these seven visible color, colors. So we've got the, the spiritual light of the Torah. If we are like a menorah, then we are taking that white light, that enlightenment from heaven, the spiritual Torah, you put that in us, and then what the earth sees is what we project. They have to see the spirit in us, in this physical being. And so what we end up then is with concentric circles, just like this. And if you can see that in your mind's eye, then you can understand where it says uh, here in Ezekiel 128, it says, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So the radiance of heaven, its appearance is like a rainbow, but then he tells us it's surrounding, it's going around. If you want to understand the glory of Adonai, then you don't just see this, you see that surrounding glory of his spirit. And once we understand this pattern, it's going to help us to understand the Garden of Eden and its structure. And then it's going to help us to understand where we go at the resurrection.